Hi, I'm Tris, and welcome back to Digital Pride. Uh, we're having an amazing conversation in just a few seconds about LGBT icons. Who are our icons? How important are they to represent us in the media? How important are they to our day-to-day -day lives? Um, and how, uh, who are we going to be looking forward to in the, in the future? Um, Joining us to lead that conversation is Adam Smith, uh, a person who um, is perfect to, to moderate the panel uh, today because he's been involved in so many different parts of media. He's a journalist, he's a writer, he's a social media expert, and he's a filmmaker. And he'll be introducing us to the other incredible creatives we gathered for this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Well, thanks very much for joining us today, everyone. Uh, as Tris said, I'm Adam, and I'm going to be moderating this discussion about LGBTI icons. I wanted to start with a um, very brief story of my own. When I was 15, there was a, a TV drama on Channel 4 in Britain called Queer as Folk, which for probably mostly gay men, but certainly gay people and LGBTI people broadly, was a bit of a turning point in, in British TV. And um, I was, I was, so I was 15, and this was a story about um, several promiscuous gay men uh, and unlucky in love gay men in Manchester. And there was a character called Nathan Maloney, who was also 15 at the same time. Um, Nathan and I were very, very different people. I was watching Queer as Folk in my bedroom and really fast forwarding through the drama just to get to the snogs <laughs> and the other bits. And uh, whereas Nathan was going out on the scene in Manchester and uh, as he says, I'm doing it, I'm really doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that line. <laughs> and um, and uh, Nathan was played by a, an actor called Charlie Hunnam, who I not only desired, but also liked his character. And um, Charlie and I uh, have diverged somewhat in our, in our lives. If you see Charlie now, he's now a very, very strong, buff, uh, very, very sort of masculine, straight male actor in American TV dramas and American movies. And I actually caught sight of him recently on the cover of Men's Health magazine mm -hmm. this month, uh, giving his tips on, uh, I don't know, how to get abs or something. <laughs> and um, in the magazine, he, he reveals that his, uh, he's most recently listening to um, Taylor Swift, Shake It Off. So <laughs> he and I do still have something in common, <laughs> at least. Um, I want to introduce the panel. On um, my far right, we have Owl, who is a transgender and queer activist from Iceland. And uh, Al, you either founded or helped to run all of Iceland's LGBTQI <laughs> uh, organisations. And um, now our works on projects across Europe to do with transgender and queer rights. Um, next to Owl is Fox Fisher, who's an artist and a filmmaker and a campaigner, also on trans rights, uh, regular in the media and uh, on Channel 4's uh, My Transsexual Summer, very famously, and also helps to run My Generation, along with Owl, actually. Uh, on my left is uh, Leon Lopez, who's a, an actor for 20 years. You may recognise him from Brookside and EastEnders um, and various other um, programmes, and also from the stage at the Donmar Warehouse and with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and also as the uh, director and writer of uh, a great British film called Soft Lad, uh, which was out a couple of years ago now and uh, only cost 17 grand to make, which is an amazing achievement. Um, and then on my far left is Patrick Cash, who's a playwright and spoken word artist, um, uh, who has most recently written um, the HIV monologues, uh, at, which was uh, shown at the Ace Hotel in Shoreditch, if you're cool enough to go there. <laughs> and uh, also very recently, the Chemsex monologues, which are on at the King's Head Theatre in London. So um, thanks very much to the panel for joining us to have this discussion about LGBT icons. The um, icons are obviously very important through LGBTI history, everything from Oscar Wilde having kind of queerish characters, but also standing up as a man in court and saying that there's nothing unnatural about sex between men, for example, all the way through to all the, way to the 20th century to one of my favorite ones, Gladys Bentley, who is a, um, a drag king and a sort of jazz and soul performer in the Harlem Renaissance in New York. Um, all the way through to um, Ellen Page, Ellen DeGeneres, other people not called Ellen. <laughs> and, um, so it's a, there's a very long list of um, LGBT icons in, uh, in, in TV and drama and so on. Um, a lot of people will remember that Buffy Willow kiss uh, in, in, in the 90s on, on, on Buffy. Um, and I think for me, yes, Queer as Folk was a big deal, but then gradually I realised that actually it was the writer, Russell T Davis, who I came to idolise actually, um, through his subsequent works, including Cucumber last year. And, um, 
And so uh, I want to ask everyone to start really with, um, with their sharing their own stories. I've opened up about me being 15 and I want everyone else here to go back to when you were teenagers and uh, talk about your own LGBT icon. So um, Leon, I'm gonna pick on you first. Um, tell us about your icons from when you were a teenager. Well, I've just realized, I think I'm the daddy of this whole group. <laughs> I think I'm the Own oldest. <laughs> That's the first time in a long time I've to be the oldest. So yeah, I guess I probably date. I was 15 in 95, so I'm the oldest, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> only, only just. I was, I was doesn't matter. Only just doesn't really help. <laughs> I'm still the oldest five. And the game man, it's a struggle getting old. Um, <laughs> so basically, it's kind of weird. Before we go on to that, it was just something you've just said. It's uh, and not kind of oh, look at me. But I did work at the RSC this year, and it's quite. You don't realise there's lots of LGBTI people within Shakespeare and um, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, classical literature. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the play that we did actually, The Two Noble Kinsmen, um, there was uh, lesbian affairs, there was uh, kings having affairs with their um, fellow kings from other lands and things like that. And it was just, it was never looked upon, but it's there in the text. And it almost seems as if from then it's kind of been eradicated. So something happened between then yeah. and the Oscar Wilde days that kind of made it all seem a bit more taboo. Mm -hmm. uh, and thankfully now we've become a lot more enlightened and it's becoming a bit more mainstream. So I know you're getting on, but you're not as old as Shakespeare was. So I'm far off it. What, what <laughs> <laughs> so what? So tell us about when. So my, 90, yeah, 95, so me, what were you 95, watching? In 95, what was I watching? Uh, I, Queer as Folk hadn't come out yet. Actually, there was, oh, sorry, I get really excited and loud. But um, Channel 4 used to do all of these things late at night. I think it was like the red zone or something. So, And I was lucky enough to have a TV in my bedroom. So <laughs> you just go, I think it was after 12 o'clock and you go on there and they'd have stuff to do. But they'd have lots of stuff like queer media and queer, uh, it wasn't called that at the time. Um, a lot of gay, um, a bit more risque type of stuff. It was before Queer as Folk, so mm. I'd watch them. But before then, things that always filtered into my childhood were, I was a massive fan of the film Cry Baby and mm -hmm. Hairspray. Mm -hmm. Not the musical version, the original mm -hmm. version, the John Waters version. Uh, and at the time, I didn't even think of it. I didn't really, I mean, I was quite a late developer when it comes to puberty. And, uh, I didn't really identify as being gay till probably very late teens. So at the time I was watching all of these films and I was just, I just loved the characters. You know, Divine was a mm. huge um, presence at the time. Uh, and I just loved all of the, you know, you had Ricky Lake, who obviously isn't necessarily LGBTI, but all these icons who you could kind of relate to as a person. I didn't realize how much they affected me as a child and all mm. of the things that were going on within then, um, Do you think Boy was something George that was probably the biggest yeah. influence of my life. Again, but not as being gay. Mm. It, uh, Culture Club, the music of Culture Club was a big part of my life because um, I used to think that, um, is a karma chameleon, I used to think they were saying, come to me, Leon. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I became a massive fan. It's your own personal <laughs> yeah, like theme tune. As a child. That's brilliant. So well, thanks, that Boy George. Anything yeah, that definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Patrick, how about you? Uh, what were you watching when you were fifteen? Uh, when I was or fifteen, to, yeah, I was I was extremely repressed as a teenager. I grew up in a Catholic family. Um, I went to a patriarchal all boys school and actually I've said in, in something that Leon and I have done before that I adopted this aggressively heterosexual persona but I think <laughs> aggressive gives the wrong, wrong tone like kind of passionately you know talking mm. about how fit girls are in this really loud way so, to, so as to like you know uh, put off the scent from anybody who might mm. think about your true sexuality um, and so like in pop music like in Taylor Swift as yourself and Charlie Hunnam uh, uh, do and myself too now mm -hmm. um, wasn't really an option at that time so I really was really into rock music and within mm. that I, d I really identified with lyrics because I was quite depressed um, and a lot of the lyrics I felt like had a depth that spoke to me at that time but there were no LGBT people apart from one band and I don't know if anybody remember Placebo? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Brian Malko yes. um, was my LGBTQ yes. icon right. at 15. He was bisexual, mm -hmm. he wore eyeliner, he was just didn't give a fuck, it seemed. Can I, can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, you know, and that confidence and that being the front man of a band and being in front of like, fa yeah, exactly, thousands and thousands of people like mm. in, in uh, like Reading Festival and places that aren't really 
um, associated with, uh, I guess, being liberal and being open to um, uh, homosexuality. Um, I've, but that was really empowering to me, and so I bought every single placebo album that there was. But did you feel worried at all that the association of you with that band and his persona mm. was dangerous to your aggressive heterosexuality? That was strange, because actually, like, uh, within the um, culture of me and my friends who are also into rock music, it yeah. was fine to like placebo. Yeah, 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 it was really, um, people uh, really appreciated the band um, for their music and for their lyrics. I mean, it's funny, we think of rock... great music. Right, well. and w yeah. exactly, great songs. And we think of rock music as a heterosexual domain, mm -hmm. and yet, like, yeah. every rock star in the 80s was wearing spandex mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, prancing around, and Mick Jagger yeah. is, you know, a very, very yeah. famous, like, non-conforming Ex straight person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, we all and David Bowie, yeah. Yeah, 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 and Bowie, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And so yeah. Bowie would, like, come on with, with placebo, et cetera. Exactly. Let's... Yeah. Ho hop over to these guys, Owl, growing up in Iceland, who are your <laughs> icons? Well, uh, I'm just going to be completely honest. I was 15, living in rural Iceland in the northwest in a farm with 30 cows and 200 sheep <laughs> and my parents. Right. So <laughs> I didn't really have the access to media or to, to the same extent as people, even though I'm not very old. Uh, I was very isolated and I was in a, a school with under 100 people mm. and it was just a very small community and there was no one there that was queer that I knew uh, and I didn't even have a proper TV channel in my house so it wasn't like I could access the internet or any of these things mm. uh, so I don't remember being 15 and having many icons we barely you know had internet uh, when did you first stumble across someone who you could look up to as an LGBT icon? Then? I think it was when I, uh, when I moved away from the farm and I went to secondary school and that was sort of the first time where you know, I came to a proper town and there was proper internet and there was TV and stuff. So I was, yeah, I think I was about 16, 17, 18 maybe when I sort of got into it and then I just looked online on YouTube channels and it was just people who were speaking out and telling their stories really and it wasn't until in my late 20s that I sort of got any role models that I saw uh, and I sort of just had to be my own role model because there was no one trans around me anywhere mm. uh, and everything you saw on TV was stuff like an Ace Ventura when uh, the main character is absolutely disgusted that he likes a trans woman yeah. uh, and it just became a very sort of I felt very ashamed of the fact that I could possibly be trans mm. because this is all you saw people obviously did not like people being trans mm. uh, which I can imagine for gay people was the same mm -hmm. uh, but maybe trans people were just a bit behind exactly yeah in that aspect yeah yeah, yeah. Fox how about you yeah pretty similar to uh, to Al's experiences yeah. although I didn't grow up on a, a farm in northern <laughs> Iceland um, <laughs> but it c I may as well I may as well have actually yeah. um, I think uh, if I rewind back before fifth the age of 15, um, kind of at the, the kind of the start of my wrong puberty as such, uh, about 10 or 11, I kind of went from being a really, really good kid or really, really trying uh, to getting into uh, a lot of heavy metal, rock music, mm -hmm. grunge mm -hmm. and stuff like that and uh, really, really enjoying that as well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I kind of became the black sheep. I started to embody that, that kind of persona, I guess, and I just kind of had this devil may care. Or is it devil may care attitude? Yeah, I suppose yeah. that's what you say, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I just... I kind of just started to um, separate myself from my body quite a lot and as the years went on I, f I felt more and more separated from who I was becoming and my body was really betraying me so by the time I hit 15 I, I really had lost all interest in life I think I mean I was I was doing my best to get on with school but I kind of had two lives as well and so I would I would get the grades just so my parents would leave me alone and then I would go off and and I'd be going out clubbing I'd be taking drugs drinking you know all that kind of stuff because I, I just thought you know what what's I was trying to find the point in life I suppose so mm. yeah. um, as for role models I mean I remember watching uh, Queer as Folk back in the day as well and that was that was incredible and that was really wonderful to have and, and again Russell T Davies is just mm. such a fantastic writer mm -hmm. um, and again with Cucumber and Banana mm. and Tofu as well uh, last year that was mm. incredible and, and also the fact that Russell T Davies gives writers, new writers, a yeah. chance to write and, and the fact that he took a chance on a trans person or took a chance on a, a genderqueer writer writing about trans people yeah. and then had an actual trans person play their role yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. But um, as a teenager it was, it was just really, really lost years. Like if I could go back and say you know, Fox just, you know, I, d I don't know, there just was no information around there, you know, yeah. if, if I'd grown up with YouTube around that time, I would have started to see 
other people who are like myself, mm. but there was just no reference point at all. So, Do you remember the first person, or w maybe there wasn't one, I don't know, who you stumbled across and you thought, you know, that's someone who I can <coughs> really relate to? I mean, um, it, was, it was always kind of looking for something that wasn't really there. I suppose there was um, a series on MTV called My So-Called Life that oh was yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah, awesome at the time. Yeah. Um, and I just remember really feeling quite connected to the characters and thinking, oh, they kind of felt like they could have been my friends or something. Yeah. But um, you know, I don't think I was alone with the kind of the angsty teenage feelings. I think everyone has that, don't yeah. they? But yeah. it was kind of like layers and layers of, of, of stuff going on that I kind of had to keep peeling back the layers and start to understand more about myself. But it's really funny when you talk about angsty teenagers because, <laughs> like, you know, we've all been there. Yeah. Um, and um, Patrick, it was placebo, mm -hmm. and, you know, everyone placebo, had their thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's funny when you, when you think about a lot of teenage dramas, um, that there's a question about how. Um, how real they are mm -hmm. and for me like the teenage drama was Dawson's Creek yeah which is <laughs> hilarious now looking back yeah. at it and thinking that was a drama that was <laughs> it was a melodrama right. um, you know there was a lot of James van der Beek just frowning uh -huh. um, but uh, it, it looking back now and knowing what I know now about a lot of stuff that teenagers go through especially LGBT plus teenagers mm -hmm. which is like some really much more serious stuff mm -hmm. I know there was the LGBT storyline in Dawson's Creek and it was handled relatively well I think but um, but still, uh, I'm interested in like for teenagers, how real do you think um, dramas should get, and how real can they get? You know, can they can they really push the envelope, or do they have to stay safe because they're still for young people? You know. Wow, I think I think young people can uh, definitely take in quite a yeah. lot. I mean, it, it, I don't think you need to sense yourself much at yeah. all, really. Mm -hmm. you know. The yeah. problem isn't with the audience, though. The problem is with the commissioners, the right. people at the top, and it's mm -hmm. always going to be that way, which is why. You know, TV does seem to be dwindling and the internet seems to be thriving right. yeah. because you've right. got people with no restrictions who are going on YouTube, who yeah. are actually saying stuff that relates to these people. But still, the people at the top, like I know myself, I'm pitching stuff now to different people and it's like, oh, we can't get away with that. Oh, it's a bit wide mm. of the mark. Oh, mm. that's a little bit too on the nose. Oh, we like that, but can we soften it? Mm. You know, because they're worried that Middle England, mm. no offence, but Middle England is quite... Um, conservative yeah you mm -hmm. know they're afraid mm -hmm. they're afraid of losing of those people yeah. but the thing that gets me is like you know when they t speak about figures and things like that everyone knows there's no real figures about people who are watching stuff it's like i don't mm. know there's yeah, a small yeah. percentage yeah. of the population who are monitored mm -hmm. and then it's times by they don't really know but at the end of the day when it comes to the bbc channel 4 itv all the big networks they are afraid mm. i even know when i was younger when i was in brookside for example like we used to have meetings with the producers and stuff and we talk about our storylines and we're like oh i want to do this and oh we could do that oh no we have to watch with you because you know you're an actor of color we have to worry how mm. and this was years ago and mm. i don't know i mean probably it's it's probably relaxed a lot more now but i don't think it's probably relaxed that much mm. so when it comes to lgbt um themes within stuff they're afraid because they don't know who their audience actually mm. is mm -hmm. and i think as i say the only savior that we've got is the internet we've got all of these mm. multimedia platforms now where people are out there putting stuff out and people can do it for quite cheap nowadays so mm. and still get good quality of course the thing about middle england I I, I know what you're saying about the, the networks being conservative themselves and reflecting what they perceive to be the values in Middle England. And Afraid that of the fears. That of yeah, exactly. And that that right, right. And that might be uh, the, uh, the the dominant feeling among like parents in Middle England, but for every one of those parents, there are teenagers in bedrooms yeah, who are yeah. not conservative <laughs> and who want <laughs> to see this. And that's why they're going on YouTube. But those parents yeah. feel like they're responsible for those kids. Yeah. The yeah. thing yeah. is, who at 15, we all think that we know who we are. Mm -hmm. But those parents are thinking, my actions are going to affect mm. what they are. Yeah. So of course, mm -hmm. those parents are the ones to worry. They're the ones mm. who pay for the internet. Mm. They're the ones who pay for the TV license. Yeah. They're the ones who pay for the computers in the bedrooms. Yeah. So mm -hmm. sadly, you do have to kind of tap in with them. And I think there has been progress. And there is progress, but it is slow. Mm -hmm. And as I say, the only savior that we have got is the internet, so we have to mm. pray yeah. that there's no restrictions put on it and <laughs> yeah, you'll get true. barred from using it. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk about the tension that uh, maybe writers or filmmakers or TV producers feel about, um, uh, uh, especially people who are um, you know, LGBT, about representing the community mm. because um, every time you know there's a new film, a new gay film that's got an HIV subplot, then you get people say, oh, we need broader stories than just mm -hmm. the HIV story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every time there's a transgender plot, there's a discussion about, you know, we, do we need more than the simple transition story? You know, mm -hmm. we need richer stories of, of these people. So I'm interested in hearing everyone's thoughts on the panel on uh, the pressure that LGBT creators feel to mm -hmm. represent. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think there is think? a huge pressure because we've had such bad representation for so long uh, that now we're sort of reaching for we want something really good and we want something that we can reflect on mm -hmm. and that people can see themselves in the th things that we make. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the pressure is a lot, but I think that also creates a lot of better stories because now we're seeing, uh, especially when it comes down to trans people, we're not focusing on trans people being uh, sort of sex workers or being a shock factor or being something disgusting. Now they're actually becoming actual people with actual lives and mm -hmm. it's not just about them being trans because being trans is often just a part of who you are mm -hmm. and then you have to deal with the rest of life. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that we're more moving now towards making LGBTQI characters be people in series without them just being that character and that's the only thing they're important for. Yeah. Well, yeah. Building upon that, I think like LGBTQ mental health is a real and significant problem and mm -hmm. that's yeah. because of societal inequality and the way that society yeah. is structured and mm -hmm. the way that we grow up. We grow up hiding ourselves away for the most part from our from realizing we're um, we're gay or um, otherwise sexuality or, or gendered, and then hide it away till our glorious coming out. But that's mm -hmm. generally the whole of our formative period mm -hmm. of puberty, yeah. Yeah. and that's intertwined with your you know your most uh, formative years in your in your brain. Mm -hmm. So that is going to have effects in later life of like of creating a scene that is sometimes judgmental or sometimes overly, you know, um, uh, full of low self worth perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that I think to honestly tackle that is important within now. LGBT mm -hmm. representation, but it's such a quagmire for people like mm. the producers, etc. Because mm. yeah. if they put someone on with um, with a, a true representation of like you know having uh, bad mental health effects mm -hmm. because of being LGBTQ, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of how they've grown up, mm -hmm. um, then they could get attacked straight away for mm -hmm. showing a negative representation yeah. of LGBTQ yeah. people. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that when you're working on something? I mean, why choose to write, for example, um, a play about HIV mm -hmm. or a play about chemsex rather than writing a play about um, a shopkeeper going about their business who yeah. just happens to be gay and maybe yeah. does chemsex at the weekend. But do you know what I mean? Like, why, I think why, why have the focus solely in, in, in this world? Yeah, well, I think that it's linked to the wider conversation about inequality, particularly drug taking mm. um, and HIV as well. If yeah. you've got you know low self worth from growing up gay, uh, you don't want to protect yourself, right. you know, and you don't value yourself. Why would you protect <coughs> yourself from yeah. HIV, whether it be by condoms or prep? Yeah. Um, chemsex as well. If you if if you've got this intertwined with your sex, particularly mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for gay men who practice chem sex, if uh, they've been told their sex is wrong and unnatural and yeah. disgusting, um, then you've got this drug that lets you get that gets rid of all of that, like mm -hmm. free drugs, mm -hmm. GHB, uh, mm -hmm. GHB um, crystal meth and methadrone. Mm -hmm. um, then you can see where, where it all connects into the wider spectrum of, of um, equality, I think. Um, particularly why I tackle them is because I think they're unspoken subjects or when they are spoken they're spoken in a slight element of hysteria mm -hmm. um, particularly in the media mm -hmm. um, so to cut through that and to show the vulnerability of mm. these people involved with it and the lovability because yeah. these are um, and uh, our, our brothers and sisters you know yeah. who, are, who are part of this right? but do you worry at all that um, it will only be LGBT people who go to the plays which is important by mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. but also maybe speaking to Middle England yeah yeah. You're miss uh, do you worry that you're missing that out? That is on, a worry. Yeah. How are you going to get you know yeah. somebody who's um, 57 and lives in Harpenden to watch yeah. a play called yeah. the Chemsex Monologues? Yeah. I don't know. Like, th they might love it. They, they never know. Yeah. We haven't gone there yet. Um, <laughs> we don't <laughs> tour. Yeah, exactly. Um, that yeah. How how are you going to entice somebody in? Um, and um, maybe, uh, maybe the technology and the internet yeah. and social media is the way forward. Yeah. You know, to get it, get it out in in those respects, and somebody might watch it because they have an interest, but they wouldn't necessarily have so much of an interest or want to be seen. Yeah. Even still, yeah. go into a theatre that says clem sex monologues. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Leon, uh, do, well, do you feel the pressure to represent? Um, I just make stories that I want to tell really because mm. I don't really have mm. no one's paying me to do it mm. so and I think yet again it's stories that I do feel people are afraid of everything comes down to fear at the end of the day things mm. that we want to do come because we're afraid of it the things that we don't want to do yeah. so it's like it's a case of well who am I afraid of I've got no one to be afraid of I'll make it and I've been lucky most of the stuff I've done so far there's always been an, there's an audience for it mm -hmm. whereas the thing with the chemsex monologues as well and the HIV monologues it's like okay x y and z in middle England mightn't see it but some people who need to, the people who need to see it yeah. will see it right. and they'll search it out and they'll find it but when it comes to representation I think 
in some ways we're the saviour, LGBTQI people, we are the saviour because we know what we want but we're also the problem because we can, you've got the side that go yes we need this voice and then you've got the other side that go we've already heard that. But what you have is you kind of develop this ignorance because like well, you're aware of that situation. There's millions of people out there who aren't. Mm -hmm. It's like when I did Soft Lab, for example, it's like I wrote it because I wanted to talk about HIV issues and it turned into this, it was a play I wrote originally and it turned into a lot of things that weren't actually to do with that and it was about relationships, being straight, struggling with your sexuality, straight women contracting diseases, living with a guy, all this madness like within this package of five different characters. And um, it was a nice way it came up anyway. A lot of the gay press that picked up on it, not a lot, but a couple of them was like, oh, we've heard this story, oh, we know this or we know that. I'm like, well, you've heard it. And you know, you might, you might think that we're aware of sexual health or we're aware of HIV issues within the gay community, but how come more kids than ever are contracting yeah, HIV? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like there's no education in schools. It's like, how can we educate kids by putting it in front of them in a format that they can go, oh, this is entertaining. Mm. Oh, shit, I didn't know that. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. You know, it's like, because you know it. Because you, in your London Ivory Tower, surrounded mm. by every queen mm. or whatever, it's like, yeah. you're the king and queen of London. Because you mm. know it. Mm -hmm. Somebody in Skegness doesn't. It's mm -hmm. like, I took it on, I was very lucky to go to Q Film Festival with it in Indonesia. And I was in tears. Because I had people coming up to me going, oh my God, this is the story. I thought I was alone. And listen to this story. We thought that the West didn't have to deal with these things. And, you mm. know, my husband, uh, somebody's husband who was having to sleep with um, a man outside of his, uh, with his wife. And then he gave his wife HIV and all these things and they were like it was so refreshing to see my story up there and know that us as Indonesians are not on our own and, and even Indonesians know, can relate to scousers exactly, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. who would so. have known that you, your story would have travelled that <laughs> <laughs> well it's the thing you get messages from people all the time going this is my story did, yeah. who did you write this about because I went through that and it's like well there's I think getting back to the whole point, which I can't remember what the question was, but it's like- Pressure to represent. Yeah, yeah, the pressure to represent. I don't feel pressure. I feel like actually I go, well, this is a story that I'm aware of, but I spoke to 10 other people and they're not aware of it. Oh, let's talk yeah, about that. Yeah. It's like the last film I did, which is like, like I'm not a, I'm not transgender, but there was I was working on a popular TV show at the time, I'm not gonna say it was, um, and they were like, I said, oh, I'm gonna write the my film, my next film is about, um, transgender violence because a friend of mine was talking to me about something and oh trans is being done <laughs> this is one of the rights I was like what right. do you mean it's trans yeah. is being done yeah. oh everyone's doing trans it's, I was like right. I'm not doing it because everyone's doing it I'm doing it because black trans women around the world are being murdered yeah. every year yeah. the, the numbers going up yeah. and it's like I want to talk about it and yeah. I want people to have a discussion about it yeah. and it was like I'm not doing stuff because it's being because so yeah. I'm doing it because I feel like these are important messages that people need to hear yeah. about. And yeah. the way to do it is through film. And yeah, it might be low budget, it might even have a big, but if the story is strong and the performances are strong, which I'm very lucky, I've got really good actor friends and stuff, and they always tend to be. And with this in particular, uh, my friend Monroe, uh, she came on board as the lead actress. And the film is like, it is mind blowing. It's horrible to watch, mm. it's fucking horrific. Mm. But you know what? The shit that's happening mm. to these women is fucking horrific. Sorry yeah. to keep swearing. <laughs> Fox, can you pick up on that point? Yeah, big talk. up Monroe as well. I love Monroe. <laughs> yeah. She's fantastic. She's awesome. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about you know your the the um, the attitudes that you come into contact with through the various work that you do For with sure. the media. Yeah, yeah. Um, about that point. I mean, do a lot of people think that let's do trans because it's hot right now, or let's not do trans because it's been done? Yeah, that's that's really the topic of conversation at the moment. Right. That we're finding. Uh, you know, if you don't see yourselves represented, obviously you start to write about, about things to do with you know, your situation and you start making films, you start mm -hmm. acting in certain films as well. So mm -hmm. that's what I've been doing for the past five or six years. Um, I was on a documentary that I wasn't hugely happy with the edit, so uh, I picked up a camera myself and started making films yeah. about people around me. So I started off doing documentary type stuff and I'm kind of edging more into fiction now. Um, I've got a couple thoughts. Uh, one is, um, I helped set up a, a trans acting course at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, and that was because there was a huge gaping hole in, you know, there was just no, writers would often say, oh, I really wanted to cast a trans person, but mm. I couldn't find any. Yeah. So I was like, well, okay, here you go, here's yeah. a bunch. <laughs> and uh, same with um, a lot of people actually recently, and same with soaps as well, they, they, they are reaching out to trans people to consult, mm. consult on, on things. So I consulted on the EastEnders, mm. uh, you know, trans storyline, and you know, they need a lot of work with the script and stuff. And, I think with, with cis writers that are just approaching this, I think it's so important for them to reach out and have someone mm -hmm. trans that's just there to, cons you know, to have a look at the yeah. words and say, yeah, yeah that's, that's about right, or no, they would never say that, they'd never do that. Yeah. And, and that's the, obviously you're gonna get much more authentic content if, you, if you're gonna yeah. do that and make yeah. the effort. 
so we're doing a lot of collaborations with various people at the moment, like with you know web series. There was a writer uh, last year who got in touch and said that she'd written a role specifically for me, and I was mm -hmm. like, okay, that's that's interesting. And actually, you didn't know before. I had no idea so at all. So she was working away on this. Yeah, and then and here it was, this finished script. Wow. So I was like, oh, okay. So <laughs> she cast me as the sensitive RT trans man, like right. a binary trans man as well. So, okay. and just as an aside, you know, when we do see trans representation, representation in the media, it's often you know kind of a very heteronormative. Yeah. Yeah. you know kind mm -hmm. of very binary it's about their bodies yeah or, yeah exactly yeah. so we're trying to expand that a little bit as well and I yeah. think you know even when I was doing the documentary five years ago I started to talk about being non-binary and they said look the audience is not going to understand that can you just simplify it please mm -hmm. and so I wasn't allowed to talk about my identity mm -hmm. you know then yeah but I think we are we're getting a bit more sophisticated yeah, now yeah. and you know it, it's so nice to be able to contribute you know actually um, get involved with film projects and you know but I, I feel quite um, anxious as well because we're called up all the time by pr uh, production companies that somehow you know they're a big company and they managed to get the commission and mm. they know nothing about trans issues right. and yeah. they don't they're not interested actually in taking someone on board and I, yeah. you know we recommend we recommend used, yeah you feel, used, you feel you feel people absolutely yeah, yeah. totally used and, and you know energy it just you know we're all you know i just feel yeah. like there's such a huge burnout rate with with this kind of stuff and mm. i'm sure mm. that's not just in the trans community that's across board isn't it you it was know? the same even just as people actors of color years ago yeah. and even now yeah. and it's like literally Oh, there's no, there's no actors of colour out there. Yes, there is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like there's not. Or you know, they'd call people on board to assist on certain storylines, but not give them a job. Right. Yeah. It's like, well, no one's yeah. behind the scenes because you won't give them a bloody job. But you'll have yeah. to use the information, yeah. the intel, yeah, yeah, and it's it. exactly the same. It's like every time it comes to minority groups, it's the same thing. But it's because the people at the top are heteronormative, normally middle class white men. Yeah. No offence yeah. to like yeah. intended to anybody out there. Yeah. You know, I know people will take offence, but still, so they're representing <laughs> what they know. Of course yeah. they yeah, are. Yeah. So they go, oh, yeah. well, come on board and I'll take your ideas and then you know, not yeah. give you any money. Yeah. Not, it's, it's like, yeah. but I think you guys are empowering. It's amazing that if you're actually making your own stuff mm. and just, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I'm going to look. And, and so I suppose that's the, the, the question is, um, YouTube gives everyone a platform yep. for, mm -hmm. for, for, for making their own kind of stuff. You can build your own website as you sure. have, whatever, you know, do all of that stuff. Um, you, the question is, do you reach as many people as someone watching, as, as Channel 4 can? If you're a really successful YouTuber, if you're really good, I suppose. That's yeah. right, and you can reach many more. And in and fairness, Channel 4 probably doesn't even get a million views for some of the no. top no, things. No, so no, no, no. YouTube it won't. Do. It won't. So, yeah, so do, you think that's the way, do you think that's the way it's going? I mean, that there's so many documentaries appearing on YouTube now, and there's yeah. different platforms using YouTube for exactly that, and they get millions and millions of hits. Yeah. They would never get those hits if they would put it on a TV station. Mm, yeah. So I think mm -hmm. the TV stations are actually quite scared yeah. of YouTube yeah. and social media yeah. because they're taking over in views because nobody, you know, people want to see authentic content made by the people involved. Mm. They don't want to see a cis crew making a documentary about trans people mm -hmm. because their view will always be skewed. Yeah. They will mm -hmm. never get it mm -hmm. and they will never actually focus on what needs to be focused yeah. on. Yeah. I suppose it's a question of money as well, you know, how are you going to get the money and obviously there's a lot of useful ways to, to raise money these days. Crowdfunding is quite popular, yeah. you know, people are totally cool with that, it seems. Patreon, um, and just applying for different grants that are around, but you know, everybody's, you know, scrabbling around for this money, so it can be a bit, a bit difficult. Very what, competitive. Yeah, very competitive. Yeah. What we've learned to do is just make something on a budget of nothing, you know, yeah. but, then, but then you're trying to compete with the big boys that have thousands and thousands, so yeah. Yeah. I, I, it just doesn't feel that even, and it'd be nice to have a bit of a leg up, but mm -hmm. you know, if you're passionate about something, you always find a way, don't you? Who do we, um, who, who, who do you think young people are looking up to uh, these days on, and it probably is YouTube, you know, let's name some yeah. names. Sure. Davey Wavy. Davey Wavy. Oh yeah, Davey Wavy, Callum Muswigan. Yeah. Callum yeah. Muswigan's fantastic, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Alex Bertie for yeah. trans people, and his uh, boyfriend Jake Edwards as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's a guy who just came out, he was actually stealth for a really long time, he's just right. kind of come out, um, his name's Jaden Whale, and he just gets so many hits mm -hmm. as well. So and yeah. a lot of these are, uh, they're essentially vloggers, right? They're vloggers, I mean, they're, yeah. They're, they're yeah. talking about their experiences and their lives mm -hmm. um, and doing it very openly, especially, yeah. you know, in everyone's case. I mean, I'm thinking of Callum as well, especially, yeah. I mean, his that's a whole journey yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> right there. Absolutely. It's a whole story arc. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, I suppose you you can make money from views and, and mm, things, but yeah. I always also YouTube invest in their people as well. Yeah. So if you get over yeah. a certain amount of subscribers, That's then right. YouTube will give you access to all of their facilities. It's over ten k. I isn't think, it? and a good yeah. the things yeah. will always be key to be those people. Are those people at YouTube are getting something from that. I think any bit of money that you get, invest in equipment. That's it. Yeah. If you invest in equipment, because the only thing these big companies have got that you haven't got more is kit. equipment. Yeah. Yeah. So the more yeah. kit that you have, the better it is. Don't hire, never really hire yeah. equipment. Yeah. I don't think anyway. People say it, but if you, 
buy your own equipment, then everything's going to look just as good as yeah. anything that they're going to put out. Take you to tutorials. Using yeah. YouTube to watch blogs is great, but use it to look at cinematography That's tutorials. Totally yeah. Use mm -hmm. it to look out how to edit sound, all of these things. And have if you've got a team of you, have different people who are really yeah. good at different things. Yeah. And that way, you've got your own production company and you don't need to worry about those That's people. That's it. And mm -hmm. they're all afraid. I know that they're all afraid. All of these big production companies are afraid yeah. because people like Channel 4 are even trying to cash in on it. They've got their all four platform yeah. and they've got a thing now where if you can put if you can pitch something to them but if you go to it made already they'll give you i think it's like a thousand or two thousand pounds per minute that's what happens so you to can us pitch yeah. stuff and then yeah. you've got but yeah. again put it back into the business put yeah. it back and then eventually yeah and it's not like i want to put those people out of business all of those companies but it's that's a bit like come off you can stay in the dark yeah. ages for so long or yeah. you can open exactly. up people. it's great the technology is offering this revolution in a way of like subverting the patriarchal structures mm. of power mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that, that have been uh, dominant over our representation mm -hmm. for so long, mm -hmm. you know, deciding that Queer is Focus the only programme for yeah. you know, yeah. a decade essentially right. that's going to yeah. show LGBT And it was still pretty present. narrow in, its yeah. in itself. And no offence to Rusty Davis, but then the next commission that you do on that scale is to the same writer who wrote it then, when I know personally there was mm. four or five plus right. big, great LGBT right, writers right, right. who were writing stuff with great ideas, yeah. but mm. again the channel was like, oh we're not going to take a chance, let's go with somebody yeah. tried yeah. and tested. Yeah. But then again, to be fair, but Banana was really great because it went along so yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. Yeah. And I think that was kind of why it won over most of the commissions because they it was mm. a bigger platform, it scoped over three. You had the internet, you had mm. the on you had the cable, then you had the TV. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's like why are you silencing other voices that are there and just as powerful? And because for me I loved it, I, I did enjoy it a lot. But I was hearing a lot of the same things that I heard 15 years ago. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you know, there's things that aren't being tapped into and there's people out there with voices who could actually broaden that a bit I think more. that was why they did Banana, right? I mm. mean, that, w that was the idea. I know what you're saying. Yeah. It probably wouldn't have reached a b as big an audience as Channel 4. But then it's like, why not take the risk of putting why not take the, risk? the same place? It's like, because you're afraid. Yeah. yeah. And I get it. Yeah. Fear's a bit, you know, we yeah. all, you know, we're yeah. LGBTQI people. We're all afraid. We've had we're a lot of fear. What about uh, theatre? Patrick, I mean, it obviously it doesn't reach as many people as you mm -hmm. can reach on YouTube <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And you tend to think of as theatre as being very, um, as had a long tradition. We talk about Shakespeare mm -hmm. of representing uh, queer people in all sorts of different ways, and it kind of is generally like a much more playful, open space. Yeah. Is that um, am I am I dreaming about that? Or no, it, I think like, like um, I think part partially because of what we were just talking about, the lack of representation on television, yeah. um, theatre has been you know. Uh, a means and a mode for um, uh, LGBTQ people to go and see themselves mm. represented. Mm. Um, where so th there have been like you know uh, many plays over the years that have like uh, you know my, my name is Reg, um, Beautiful mm. Thing started off as a play, right. you know, um, um, and uh, as is in America, Larry Kramer as a, as, yeah. as, as a, a very famous writer, um, Angels in America has come yeah. back to the national, you know, yeah. um, all these plays over over the years they've become phenomenally. Su phenomenally successful amongst the LGBT community um, because they are given honest representation. Mm -hmm. They're given emotional truth, I mm -hmm. think, like without sounding too pretentious. <laughs> yeah. That's what you want when you see something yeah. like if, uh, in art that is going to connect with you. Yeah. It has some emotional truth to your own experience. Yeah. And mm -hmm. theatre has been the um, platform for providing that when th TV's been lacking. I thought it was interesting that London just revived The Boys in the Band, yeah. right? Which is yeah. a really old play yeah. and film mm -hmm. and ha has faced a lot of criticism from the gay community for representing, mm -hmm. um, you know, self-hatred basically yeah. for being about yeah, self-hatred yeah. and, gays don't hate and themselves no, 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 they do but the question <laughs> was you know, the, the, yeah. the debate about that play is always like it, you know it, is it right to, to to go to the depth that that play yeah, goes yes. and, that? Yeah. And, and, and was it and is it right to I revive think it? I haven't seen I didn't see the boys in the band but I did hear um, a lot about it and to do to, to do with the actual debate about self-worth and self-hatred I think yeah. It, yeah hugely as you just said yeah, 100% yeah. and it kind of ties in with um, Matthew Todd's book straight jacket mm. that's just been released mm. how to be gay and happy and people have yeah. been like um, you know most people have responded really well to to the book and it's an amazing book I think myself from having read it um, and uh, but it's very honest about the experience and about yeah. about that there are mental health effects and yeah. a lot of people have railed against that because right. they want to say no I am fine I'm absolutely or they or they haven't you know they haven't even admitted it to themselves yet it's such a yeah. fawny um, psychological yeah. uh, serpent eating itself in yes. some ways yeah but also it's like why are we afraid to look outside of ourselves it's like 
we're a community. There's, there's it, we can look at ourselves as individuals, but you can go, this doesn't affect me, but actually I'm aware that it's affecting people out there, so mm -hmm. it is relevant. Mm -hmm. I saw it, and I've worked a lot with Pat over the last couple of years. I did a little documentary about the Let's Talk About Gay Sex and Drugs, mm -hmm. like, which kind of mm -hmm. helps as a community response to all of this self self hate and load that we've got as a community. Mm -hmm. But then as part, I did, I was acting in a film called G O'Clock, which was similar type of thing, and I watched it and I went, Goodness, you replace that alcohol that they're talking about with crystal mm. meth with G. Mm. It's exactly the same and it's mm. modern and it's now and it's mm. here and we need to speak about it. Mm -hmm. Don't why mm. the thing is we have to speak about problems just by saying that you're not facing it. Just speak about things because you go, it doesn't affect me, but oh you're okay. Come to me. Let's talk about it as a community. We don't talk to each other, mm -hmm. we're afraid, we keep things locked in. Mm -hmm. And it's like things like theatre allow a discussion mm -hmm. and that's what we need to have discussion, mm -hmm. conversation and talk about mm -hmm. the things that are affecting mm -hmm. us. But by saying that oh it's not affecting me anymore and closing up what you're doing is you're making people go behind the closed doors and injecting themselves slam and all these mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. because they, people think oh, well i'm not accepted by everybody yeah. else i think yeah the only thing um about um theater gives a certain amount of filter to it you know it has to go through like tv and yeah. youtube possibly doesn't have that so yeah. luckily most people we've been talking about are really positive like and seem really open-minded and and understand the lgbtq experience and mm. they become popular because of that but then you could get someone who's like completely mask for mask you know straight mm. acting mm. um uh, preaching this as the way to be and i'm sure there are people out there mm. on youtube saying that who are getting followers and you mm. know mm. and um not to say that anyone who describes themselves as mask for mask is um, <laughs> mentally ill. Um, but um, I think there are certain elements of internalised homophobia that yeah. go in uh, hand, hand in hand with yeah. that. Yeah. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so I, I want to sort of round off the discussion by um, going back, sort of going back to our first question, which is um, uh, the icons that we were looking up to when we were a lot younger, mm -hmm. but sort of bring it back to now and think, who are the icons that we all individually look up to now and how have they changed in that time and um, for me I guess um, it is it, it's more writers um, as a writer oh, yeah. myself so yeah Russell T Davis is one of them and everything that um, he's done uh, obviously Andrew Haig the uh, mm. huge you know writer and, and, and filmmaker now um, uh, also novelist Alan Hollinghurst I just read his yeah, yeah. last book it's a very very narrow portrayal um, of, of gay life but he's just a brilliant writer and also for me now uh, it's a lot of political writers and historians actually mm -hmm. um, books by there's the Robert um, uh, Beachy book about Berlin Jim Downs mm -hmm. did a book uh, an American historian last year called Stand By Me um, and so I, I look up to those writers tho those those storytellers and so that's how my mm -hmm. shift has changed from oh there's a handsome boy on the TV yeah. um, or on stage all the way through to like the writers yeah. so um, Al why don't you begin who, who are your icons um, now and how has it changed I think uh, my icons are more as you said sort of writers or people who also make political things not just actors that you see on TV but people who actively advocate okay. for trans rights people like Kate Bornstein right. uh, and Janet Mock because right. what they do is they they bring this personal element to everything so it becomes a very radical notion they make themselves very vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, which is what I like to call radical vulnerability is when you make something very personal mm -hmm. it becomes very radical and you put yourself out there and then you reach so many people yeah. uh, and I think people like that are definitely the sort of people I'm looking up to but I'm also looking to the people around me that I yes. know personally yeah. because yeah. these people are often very inaccessible and you can't actually ever talk to them so I'm also just very amazed by the people around me. There's an amazing writer called Juno Roche mm. that I know, and she writes articles and mm -hmm. books, and she's just one of the most amazing people that I've known mm -hmm. uh, in the community. And I think we need to mm -hmm. think about ourselves as well and look up to one another and yeah. support another, yeah. support each other as well. Yeah. Fox, yeah. how about you? Yeah, um, echoing what Al says as well, absolutely. Um, people like Monroe Bergdorf, I think, mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, Monroe is a fantastic uh, model just getting on with, with life and uh, she's got a great attitude, I think, about, about everything and it seems like the bigger she gets, um, she, her ego doesn't get bigger as well. You know, she mm -hmm. keeps that, that humbleness and I really, really value that in, in people. Um, Charlie Cavell, I think, is a great writer mm -hmm. as well. Um, they wrote an episode of Banana and mm -hmm. uh, they're doing some good work. 
Uh, also, uh, Silas Howard, um, I don't know. Right, yeah. yeah, Silas Howard, wow. for people who don't know, is uh, a director uh, and writer of Transparent. So, yep. um, really, great, really great series and a great example, I think, of how a mainstream uh, production can incorporate trans people into every element, right from the writing, mm -hmm. you know, the group of writers, up to, you know, who's going to act in it as well and, and who's going to direct it too. So. Yeah. And Silas Howard, it, you know, has form. I mean, Hook yeah. or By Crook was a and film yeah. from how many years ago? It was like a 90s film, like I think. 20 years ago, yeah. maybe? I maybe would say more. And, and they're in a band, and you know, yeah. there's just so many cool things about Silas Howard. And it's and also, yeah, yeah, just a very, very interesting creator, and Hook or By Crook is just still, still today such a, like, shocking and provocative mm -hmm. film, and just a really interesting film. It's just, there's nothing like it. Yeah. Um, okay, let's just wrap up really quickly, you guys. Who are you looking up to now? No one. <laughs> you're, uh, you're at the top of the pyramid. No, God, no. <laughs> There's no, no one up there. I think like my um, my icons, because I've never really had anybody even, because but people like she's not even gay, but my mum, you know, <laughs> giving me positive yeah, yeah, mental yeah, yeah. attitude to go ahead <laughs> yeah. and say there's nothing. That, and I think it's it's people like that, you know, when I speak to kids and they're saying that their family supports them and pushing them, because that's where the goodness comes from more than anything. Mm, yeah. I don't. I, um, as a filmmaker, I really look up to Andrew with all the stuff. Yeah. Like he's my best friend. Yeah. Um, and what he did with TV as well with looking, because yes. I thought that was beautiful that's and amazing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, but just people out there doing good. Yeah. Doing it, Pat. Too. Yeah. Um, writers like um, Alan Harmonhurst, yeah. um, Edmund White, um, yeah. Jamie O'Neill, who wrote uh, Swim Two Boys, which I found when I was shortly after I was 15 and mm -hmm. was in, uh, such an inspiring book. Um, performance artists linked to Brian Malko, David Hyle, like, um, I think is brilliant for being visible and outspoken. Yeah. Um, and then recently I saw um, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, uh, Xavier Bertel. We were mm -hmm. just talking beforehand how the Prime Minister of Iceland mm -hmm. is lesbian. Yeah. Um, and Xavier Bertel is an out gay man who is a Prime Minister. I saw him make a speech to the London uh, Business School, and it was one of the most inspiring speeches I've ever seen. And I think I want to see more politicians and um, Prime Ministers and world leaders mm -hmm. who are mm -hmm. LGBTQ. Well, you heard it here first. Patrick's going to run for office. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that brings us to the end. So thanks to everyone on the panel, Owl, Fox, Leon, and Patrick. And um, yeah, thanks very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for watching. Please do comment below the line. Send us all of your thoughts and questions. That'd be great. We'd love to see them.